All right, welcome to Friday, March 18th. Sure good to see you today. <laughs> Sorry, looking over there at Cooper there. Today we'll do the intro for Judges and we'll read chapters 1 through 3. Maybe I should scoot over a little bit to keep this whole thing uh, appropriate. So when we get to the book of Judges, um, I kind of hear... Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi in his cave, you know, talking about the dark times. Uh, some dark times are coming. There's seven cycles of sin. In these seven cycles, each time, you know, a leader dies, they fall into sin, they get taken over, they get oppressed, you know, they cry out to God, God raises up a judge, a judge delivers them, gives them peace for a while, and then the judge dies and then they fall back into sin. Joshua dies and leaves no successor, and I guess it could be said that that's the problem. Um, you know, my question would be, why would do we need a leader in order to do right? Why, you know, why do they need one? Uh, but apparently, a, a good leader is a good thing, or a good thing for a lot of people. So the writer of the Book of Judges is fairly unknown. Uh, tradition tends to hold to Samuel. For me, the key verse. And Judges happens twice. Before I really knew what secular humanism was, you know, when I read in Judges where it says every man did that which was right in his own eyes, you know, I thought that was a good thing. Come to find out it isn't. Everybody doing right in their own eyes, everybody has a different version of what's right. And so their version of right included sin, included idolatry, and then included servitude. So the key word would be cycles or servitude. Um, key chapter would be chapter 2. It encapu encapsulates the entire book in that chapter. Christ is portrayed here. Well, it actually shows up in chapter 2. But each judge is a savior and a deliverer of some sort. So this would have been written between the start of Saul's reign up until the division of the kingdom. Because if you notice there, in chapters 17, 18, 19, and 25... It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. So it was written during a time where they had a king. It was also written at a time where the, the kingdom had not yet been divided. You're going to find in this uh, book that the Jebusites still live in Jerusalem. And we know that David took them out in 2 Samuel chapter 5. More than likely it was written during the reign of either Saul or David. Time coverage is about 350 years, like we said, seven cycles. 21 chapters, 618 verses, 18,971 words. And again, I didn't count. You know, I sometimes try to, on these, put, you know, humor. Um, this might be one of the saddest books in the Bible. Of course, there's Lamentations, Jeremiah, but, uh, you know, Eglon and his uh, servants thinking he's on the toilet. That's a little funny, I guess, but... Uh, not only a lot of humor in this book. And while we're at it, here is a graph of the cycles, the different dates. You can see them there, uh, who the oppressor was, how many years that their oppressor, the deliverer, judge, and the years that uh, of peace that came after that. And one thing you'll notice about that, that graph is, although there are seven cycles, there are more than seven judges. You know, that graph doesn't show Shamgar at all, for instance. All right, let's go ahead and hit the reading. Well, Cooper steals uh, one other show here. All right, Judges chapter 1, uh, Joshua is dead. Uh, Israel starts its decline. But it's interesting here because people are being driven out left and right. Israel's just going gangbusters. Uh, posing kings are having their thumbs and big toes cut off. And then they're showing them mercy after that and feeding them. But then you get to verse 19. And they couldn't cast them out because they had iron chariots. Are iron chariots really the issue here? Sounds to me like Israel's making excuses. Who cares if they have iron chariots? And so the rest of the chapter is failure. God gave it to them. Now just go fight for it. Of course, it's not just only fighting that's the issue here. We're going to find it detailed in the next chapter. Sin is what the problem is. When, when, when we're in sin, we don't, we don't want to fight. We don't want to... You know, go out swinging. We don't want to do any of that stuff. And, you know, we don't have Lord's blessing behind us. It's not just that they won't fight, but it's that they won't fight for other, you know, and the reasoning behind the lack of fighting. I also want to point out here, remember, God is more 
impressed and pleased with our efforts, then he has our outcome. If these guys just would have quit, quit doing what they're doing and just go out and find God, we're delivered them. So chapter two, it seems like the first half of the chapter to me is a flashback. And then the rest of the chapter kind of just frames the entire book for us. The angel of the Lord here would be an Old Testament uh, appearance of Jesus Christ. Remember, we put our glasses on the end of our nose and say, what? This is a Christophany. And so Jesus shows up and they're ready to fight, which is interesting. This is the same Jesus that we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Remember, uh, Paul's writing word, word to individuals, not to a nation. God didn't change, just who he was talking to changed. So here we see that Joshua dies and all the rest of the generation with Joshua dies off. And then after that, they start going haywire. But notice that angel said, I will not break my covenant with you. And then you see there in verse 16, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. So it becomes a combination of they won't fight. They sin against God, God's anger of their sin, and then lack of blessing. Uh, those are the real issues, not the chariots of iron. All right, chapter three, you find the uh, first and second cycle of sin. We find intermarriage. We find uh, them taking on you know, new gods, new religion. We think, oh, no, 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 just whatever we believe, it's no big deal. Yeah, to God, it's a big deal. False religion is a big deal. We should find the place where that line is. Uh, what constitutes false religion? And it can't just be all a belief in Jesus because there are groups that do that that are plainly false teachers. All right, here we find the first judge, Othniel, who is, yes, the same guy we read before. He is the nephew of Caleb and also married his daughter, Caleb's daughter. Then the second judge is Ehud, who kills the fat man Eglon. Um, kind of a descriptive story there, don't you think? Then we have the uh, third judge, which is Shamgar, killed 600 men with an ox goat. And like me, you're probably sitting there wondering where an ox goat is. There you go. What we find here, idolatry and sin bring servitude, which is exactly what happens in our lives. We can learn so much from this book. How many times do we get a cold heart towards God, have something else uh, go on, and it turns our, heart, our hearts cold towards the Lord, and then you know, things get bad, we get our servitude, we call it to him, we're delivered, and then we're just right back in the same cycle. It's human nature. And again, why do we as humans need leaders? Uh, it'd be great if we could figure out this stuff by ourselves. And I do believe there's a large portion also of people that, that don't need that. But just as a general group as humans, um, it seems to be the case. So with that, Make sure we're praying for our leaders. I hope you have a great day today and uh, looking forward to Friday. Looking forward to the weekend and uh, hope you have a great day. Catch you tomorrow.